Today, we would now like to speak to Jeremy Awari, who is the Managing Director for Barclays Bank of Kenya. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition. Well, to start with, um, Chase Bank of Kenya has been placed under receivership and uh, depositors are now a little bit stranded. But what exactly do you think about the bank being placed under receivership? Yeah, I mean, I think it was, it's, it's clearly very unfortunate uh, what has happened. Um, and I think it's, in many ways, it came as a, as a shock to a lot of people. We've had a relatively stable financial sector for a while. Um, and when you have a scenario where a bank is open one minute and then is, is closed or put into receivership the next, um, it's very sad to see people uh, who have been impacted through no fault of their own where they can't access their hard-earned savings or access facilities that they have. So I think, I, I think what, what, there's a number of things that are going to come out that I think we need to look at. Um, how did we get into that, in, in that situation um, where, number one, we, we ended up with a set of financial statements published on one day, the 31st, and then republished with fairly significant changes less than a week later. And then there were a series of announcements, and obviously now social media has shown its power by people spreading messages, which ended up with people getting concerned and going in and asking for their money. And then ultimately, the bank couldn't fulfill its obligations. I think the other thing is the extent of insider lending. Um, uh, how did it happen? Um, and why, was, why did it not come up earlier, whether directly or indirectly? And I guess they'll need to, to identify if there was fraud involved and act accordingly. Um, and then obviously you've got the element of wh what was the auditor's role in this in terms of their accounts. In this case, they, in, they indicated a qualified opinion, which in itself suggests that they want 100% comfortable with the accounts that were presented to them. So I think the governor came in, looked at the situation, and the matters that happened then happened. Um, and I think he's trying to make sure that we follow the regulations properly. Um, in this instance, a correct reclassification of non-performing loans, mm -hmm. which is applying the, the, the regulatory standard. Um, and as I say, they couldn't meet their obligations. And so it ended up with them being put in receiverships. You've talked about um, you know, the insider lending and also the auditor's role. Um, but do you think that auditors are playing along with banking institutions to give these falsified uh, results? Yeah, the, the role of the auditor is to be an independent person to look at the book of accounts and make sure that they are a fair reflection um, of the state of affairs of the business to its board and to the shareholders. Yeah? So they're supposed to retain a level of independence. Yeah? So, and if they disagree with management's position, yeah, they can issue a qualified opinion or refuse to uh, accept the accounts because they just feel that they're not a reflection um, of what should be done within those, those book of accounts. So I think when, when, we, when we look at some of these things, I think what it will do is it was going to raise certain areas where there's going to need to be more rigor. Um, I think it's going to also raise the level of reporting and transparency around um, certain things like insider lending, whether directly or indirectly through other entities. Frankly, for governance sake, even if it is an entity that is borrowing, but there's a director who is an ultimate beneficiary, if you ask me, that should be disclosed to the board yeah, in all transparency. So that at least they can make that decision knowing that the ultimate beneficial owner is one of them and that there's no bias in terms of the credit decisions. Time will tell whether in this institution those disclosures were made. There's also a requirement for insider lending to be reported to the central bank for them also to be aware as to the regulator. So, for example, if I'm to borrow, I have to disclose my borrowing not only to my board, but I also have to disclose it to the central bank. Yeah? And the same applies for senior managers, and the same applies for the, the, the rest of the board of directors. And we treat that extremely seriously um, and are completely transparent about it. According to the CBK framework, uh, depositors can only access 100,000 shillings when a bank or banking institution is placed under receivership. But do you think this amount of money needs to be reviewed? I think it's a fair question. I mean, I think a lot of these regulations were put in place some time ago, and the value of money has changed over time, like you quite rightly indicated. So I'm sure this will come into sharp view as to what should the right level be. I think the, the fundamental level was achieved 
to protect small depositors. So what you do is you cover off the vast majority by numbers of people who would have their deposits. So you'll actually find the largest numbers will probably have 100,000 or less, and the ones above could probably afford more to be without if a situation like that came up. Mm -hmm. So I think we are probably it may need to be reviewed, but like anything, when you insure deposits, because you have to pay an insurance premium against those deposits, we can look at that threshold to give people more, more comfort. And I think it's something that we should even as an industry and with regulators look at whether that level should be 100,000, 500,000, a million or more, so that that gives depositors comfort. In event of a scenario like this, I know I have this insurance on the site, irrespective of what is happening, mm -hmm. because I think that will also build confidence in the industry per se. And that's what other markets, by the way, have done when they face times of challenge like this. Kenya has about uh, 42 banks, that is after Dubai Bank and Imperial Bank were placed under receivership. And uh, some analysts think that Kenya is overbanked. What is your take on this? I think what's vitally important is not just necessarily the absolute number of banks. I think is that you have a steady, well-capitalized banking sector that people can trust and rely on. Um, I think if you look at the absolute numbers of banks uh, compared to other countries, it would suggest just by empirical facts that we have more banks than other markets. So if you look at Nigeria, Nigeria had 80 odd banks. They, the, the central bank worked with the industry and they've now got in the region of 20, 25 banks. If you look at South Africa, they've got fewer banks and a similar size population. And the banks that are there are strong and providing banking services. But I think the spirit of allowing more banks to come up over time was to allow banking services to be provided to customers to enhance competition which would drive hopefully beneficial service. So I think now is going to come a time when banks are also going to have to revisit how are they going to convince people that they can actively provide services and give them the level of comfort that um, their money is safe and that they're relevant. So I think it's pro one can imagine over time that there may be consolidation, there may be partnerships formed. Um, and I wouldn't put that as altogether bad. I think it's just part of the normal evolution. Um, and I guess this will be part of the dialogue between Kenya Bankers Association, uh, uh, the, 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 the Treasury, as well as the Central Bank around capital levels. A lot of depositors right now are thinking they need to get their money from whatever banking institutions and either put it under their mattresses or even take it to SACOs. Um, but what do you think banking institutions need to do to restore confidence in the financial system in the country at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's, there's, no, there's not going to be a silver bullet around this answer. Um, and people need to, to think very carefully about what risks they're trading off. So, for example, today, if I take all my money out of the bank and I keep it at home, I'm exposing myself to another type of risk, isn't it? Yeah. So if somebody comes to me at home and says, hand over that money, am I prepared to defend my money mm -hmm. in that scenario? So I, I, I think we've got to get down to the very core basics. I think there needs to continue, and the governor and the central bank are doing this around rigorous application of the regulations. Yeah? That needs to happen. I think we've seen the, the central bank put in place measures that will give the, cus the customers more confidence. So we've talked about being the lender of last resort and opening this liquidity window. So in case something happens that banks know that they've got um, access to the window. But I think the governor quite rightly pointed out, banks should not abuse that position and use it for general funding. They're supposed to be a lender of last resort. If they find themselves in challenge, they can go there. Otherwise, they have to run their affairs by taking deposits and lending out in a careful way. I think even, even the level of transparency and disclosure, like I said, uh, is probably going to come under scrutiny. The level of insider loans, yeah, if it moves more than a certain percentage, this should be in public scrutiny and be available to, uh, you know, to depositors and also shareholders. Um, but I think it's, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to good governance. Um, there's also going to be in much more site liquidity levels, capital adequacy levels, which are the core, inst core measures that show you how strong uh, a bank is. But I would say the industry fundamentally is strong. Let's, even though we've had a few instances, we shouldn't generalize and say the entire industry is bad. I need to take my money out, keep it separate. I don't think that's the answer. Many banks, including banks like Barclays, very stable, very well capitalized, highly liquid. We're not going anywhere. So people should have confidence in that. And the question on everyone's mind is uh, what bank is safe? What bank is going to be placed under receivership next? And so there's a lot of uncertainty amongst uh, depositors and bankers around the country. Um, but 
what message would you pass on to anyone right now who'd like to open a bank account or one who is even thinking of moving their money from one bank to the next? I think there's obviously a duty of care. You need to obviously look into the institution that you're, that you're um, putting your money in, uh, look at the reputation. And, 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 and let's face facts, I think it is challenging for your typical depositor. You're not going into a situation where you're going to analyze the financials of that company before you put your, your 20,000, 50,000, 100,000 uh, shillings in there. And I think you can only really go by the reputation and the governance standards. So I know a lot of people are moving towards the larger banks, yeah, or the ones who have been there longer, because that's a proxy for the fact that they've probably run their businesses in a, in a, in a decent way. And I think so the levels of transparency are going to have to open out. Um, so I'm not going to say you should go to this bank or you should go to this bank because I don't know about those institutions. What I know is the general industry is, is, is generally sound. Um, in terms of our institution, we focus very much on governance, protecting people's money. And the most important thing is we are more worried about trust and protecting people's money than profit. Yeah, we, will, we would rather drop our profit yeah, and our revenues before we lose that trust. Because once that trust is gone, you don't have a business. Yeah, you know, so I wouldn't say go here or go there. What I can say is on, on our side, we are a strong bank, we're a stable bank, we're very much open for business. And if people want to, uh, to, to come and open accounts with us or, you know, or, or do their banking with us, it's because of the value proposition we offer. And, and we're very much open for that. Just setting the record straight, is Barclays Bank of Kenya exiting the Kenyan market? I think this, this is always the million dollar question and I can categorically confirm, Barclays Bank of Kenya is not for sale. Barclays Bank of Kenya is not going to close down. There are no plans for it to be sold or to close. The operations uh, of uh, people's accounts are unaffected by the announcement of PLC selling down its shareholding um, in Barclays Africa Group Limited in South Africa. So we're continuing with our strategy um, as it has been agreed with our local board and with um, our, our largest investor, which is Barclays Africa Group Limited, because we're excited really about the opportunities that exist in Kenya and the role that we can play as we move forward. For a lot of Kenyans who've been following the story of whether or not uh, Barclays Bank of Kenya is exiting the market, uh, don't seem to understand the difference between Barclays PLC, Barclays Africa Group Limited, and Barclays Bank of Kenya. Probably you might want to clarify that. Essentially, what the way it's structured is fairly straightforward. You've got Barclays PLC, which is listed um, in London. Uh, they own 62.3% of Barclays Africa Group Limited which is our parent company, which is listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And then we've got Barclays Bank of Kenya. So think about it in three tiers. Barclays PLC, Barclays Africa Group Limited, and Barclays Bank of Kenya. What is for sale, or, in, or, or what the group has announced, is that it is reducing, PLC is reducing its shareholding in Barclays Africa Group Limited in South Africa. Our majority shareholder is Barclays Africa Group Limited, which is listed in Joburg they have a 68% share of our, uh, of our share, listed shares. They have indicated that you know, they, they see exciting opportunities and they're not interested in selling uh, the business here. So we are in a sense not touched because we are second tier removed from PLC. Decisions that um, are made for Barclays Bank of Kenya are made by our board here because we're a separately listed company on the stock exchange regulated by Capital Markets Authority and the Central Bank. Um, in, and we are supported by our largest shareholder, which is Barclays Africa. A number of Barclays employees, in fact about 20 of them, went to court after they received letters uh, rendering them redundant. What exactly is the story and is it connected to uh, what exactly is going on with Barclays PLC and Barclays Africa Group Limited? What, what happened was over time, uh, we've got our business here and we opened a small uh, regional back office uh, support team because they felt that the skill sets uh, at that particular point in time were best located here. Um, now as the strategy evolved what happened is that that small team, there are about 35 of them, they were providing services to other African markets. Now as the business has evolved there's, there was a, a team that was building up in South Africa also providing regional services and it was larger than, than, than the team here. So I think you had some sense of duplication uh, of teams. So essentially the decision that was made was that we wanted to have one team and as a result uh, the, the office, uh, the small office we had here was going to be closed 
And what we did in that process is we did our level best to open up all the opportunities that may exist within our Barclays Bank of Kenya business to take them on. And in some instances, a number of them were actually applied for and offered jobs. The, the jobs that then fell away now become subject to the, to the redundancy process and discussions were held uh, with the affected employees and even looking at how can we support them to move on to the next chapter of their life with outplacement services, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, through that process, I guess some of the employees decided that they want to engage the services of a lawyer and they took that to court with a view to putting in an injunction to try and stop the office closure and that's subject obviously to, to court proceedings of which we are going through as, as we speak. So we'll wait for those court proceedings to come, to come through. What's very important that we realize is that we want to treat uh, every member of the Barclays family from an employee perspective fairly. We believe we've done so um, because it's just, it's just an evolution of business strategy. These things happen. Um, so that's, it's, it is unrelated to the announcement of PLC reducing its shareholding because people try to use that as say, oh, it's because of that, this is the first evidence. That's, that's not the case. That, that, those decisions had been made uh, before the announcement. And that's it for Captains of Industry. We've been speaking to Jeremy Awari, the Managing Director, Barclays Bank of Kenya. Thank you all for watching. For more, you can log on to our website, ktnnews.com. My name is Joy Doreen Vira.